Now when I say Romeo and Juliet, who comes to mind? Dana? Claire Danes. That's right, Claire Danes. Who else? Leonardo DiCaprio. Right? Who else? Well, you know, someone else was involved in that movie who in some ways is as famous as Leonardo DiCaprio. And his name's William Shakespeare. And some great movies are based on his plays. Hamlet. West Side Story. Talented Mr. Ripley. Waterworld. Gladiator. Chocolat. Sequel. Re re reboot. Which one will it be? It's the Ruined Childhoods Podcast. Greetings, Starfighters. This is Ruined Childhoods, and we have finally cruised through all of the states beginning with the letter A on our alphabetically ordered trek across America. On this episode, we are in the Golden State, California, which is named after the land in the story of Queen Califia, a mythical remote island rich in gold and pearls inhabited by beautiful black women who wore gold armor and lived like Amazons. But the U.S. state of California tells a different tale, one of Garlic Farms vineyards in a stretch of the five referred to as Kauschwitz, where you need to drive with your windows closed or else you are subject to the aromas of the many slaughterhouses that line the freeway. And though the California... And though the California in Queen Califia's story is robust with gold-laden black women, only 5% of the U.S. state's population is able to represent such a demographic. Should we have covered the last black man in San Francisco for this episode? Boy, would we have a segue. But instead, our tale begins in the southern region of the state with a leading cast of all-white actors. Dan, do you have any favorite memories from visiting California? Uh, well, first of all, I prefer the pronunciation California. Oh, jeez. Yes, no, it's one of my favorite Arnold words, that and bullshit. Orange County, California, reminds me of, I'm going to take you back to 1987. Oh, geez, okay. When we when we as a family, yeah. uh, John and I are brothers, uh, for those uh, unacquainted. So we traveled to California for a wedding that was being held in Orange County. Is that why we were there? Was, yes. <laughs> I have no recollection. We were there for a wedding of one of our mother's cousin's children. And we were, it was in Orange County. And we stayed with our, my mother's cousin, Cookie, and Mm -hmm. her then husband, Frank. And we stayed, I remember we stayed at, at their house. And Frank took us to like the local, cause like, all right, what the hell are we gonna do with these three kids? I was, Nine going on ten. Okay. Making making you you would have been four and Scott would have been five. Five. Uh, yeah. So all right, what am I gonna do with these kids? I'm gonna buy them ice cream, rent a movie, and shut them up in a room with the two. So we went to the local like strip mall that had like a video store and a a Ralph's or whatever. Yeah. And I, I remember These are the things that I remember. I cannot remember why I crossed the room, but I can remember that we bought the Nestle Crunch ice cream bars. They were brand new. This was like a new thing at the time. This was revolutionary to me because... Doubt they even exist anymore. uh, They sure do. Do they? Okay. The Nestle Crunch ice cream... I haven't seen a Nestle Crunch in probably... 11 years. This is a... It's a vanilla ice cream bar coated in... Nestle Crunch. Got it. And it was, I was a little fat kid. So I loved ice cream and Nestle Crunch. And here they were together at last. And we rented Three Amigos, Uh, which we have covered previously on this podcast. Check the archives. (laughs) Which is an entirely inappropriate movie for children. I mean, maybe all of our ages I think about showing it to my nine-year-old and immediately there's at least three jokes that come to mind that I'm like, oh, I don't want to have to be, I don't want to sure, have to explain yeah. that. So we watched the three amigos. I, you know, no harm done clearly, but we watched <laughs> or, the three amigos. Or irreparable damage done. 
knowing us. I, <laughs> it's the reason why we do d- this podcast. Depends on your perspective. <laughs> so going back to Orange County, that's my that's my early childhood. And of course, Orange County is where Disneyland is. So that's one of your favorite memories of visiting California is being introduced to Three Amigos while eating a Nestle Crunch ice cream bar. Correction, John. I was introduced to Nestle Crunch ice cream bars. I had seen Three Amigos already oh. in the theater. Oh, my God. We Mom took me. Talked. My God. I wanted to be specific to Orange County. We're talking about sure. Orange County today. Yeah. I'm sure I don't say orange the way because they say orange. I think they it is pronounced. I think that I have trained. I have trained the the New Jersey out of my dialect as much as possible, and I am now an orange person. You've not been an out, orange. You've been out of there much longer than than I the, have. Well, that's true. Yeah, I'm also I'm I, I'm making a conscientious effort to cling on to it. If it's anything that. People here in Seattle make fun of the way that I pronounce it. And when I say people, I mean the the teenagers who I teach. Mm. When they make fun of the way I pronounce something, I double down. They made fun of the way I pronounced water. Okay. They actually made a video for a project and it so happened they, they had a new product that they were marketing. It was a rhetorical appeals project. So they were making a commercial for a product called Water, W A U G H T E R. <laughs> and water. I loved it. I thought it was hilarious, but I'm like, now I'm just doubling down. I'm going extra hard on the war. I feel like I mispronounced, well, I shouldn't say mispronounced. I pronounced that word recently in a way that I had never pronounced it before, which was more of a Philadelphia water. Uh, kind oh. of accent where I, I mean, I lived there for five years, but yeah. certainly not long enough to get that part of my speech altered. But, and, and also it's been a long time. I mean, I moved away from there in 2007 and uh, suddenly I say water and, and out of nowhere. I will say, I've never heard you refer to anything as a John. So no, I don't think that we're not. I never felt like I was uh, allowed to use that word. It just wasn't. I wasn't there long enough. It never felt appropriate. Oh, so it was a conscious, conscious thing. Yeah, cool. I'm sh- I have plenty. Look, everybody always has plenty of opportunities to use the word John. True. Anybody can use it. You don't have to be from Philly, but I I but agree with the respect. It's not something I'm not going to start. That was it, an but... element of the movie Creed that I really liked is when uh, she's Tessa Thompson's character is kind of teaching him what the word John means. Oh, see, I, I know from Questlove. Oh, really? Yes. Not personally. Not, it, not Right. He and I did not. He's like, hey, Dan, guess what? <laughs> yeah. This is no, the word during, John. During our we- weekly chats where we he teaches me vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's the other podcast I've been working on, John. Sorry. Me and Questlove have a thing going on. I forgot to mention. That'd be amazing. It's called Questlove Teaches Dan Words. Yeah. <laughs> he teaches Dan John. It's Johns. for a niche audience. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, no, and it is a John, in fact. It is a John. So, yeah. As I've learned. So moving on, because Philadelphia is nowhere near yeah. Orange County. Not even so, Orange County, New Jersey. Right. And so you were talking about how Disneyland is in Orange County. And, uh, you know, that was also part of our trip there in 1987, as well as many millions of people every year uh you know who flock to disneyland it do, it does get get visitors it does yeah people people go and check it out every now and then i hear it's it's a fun place i don't know if you ever were there as an adult but it's a no that was the last time i was there was oh, 80 summer like on this trip perhaps on a day adjacent to mm. our evening of three amigos and nestle crunch ice cream wow bars. i don't I don't remember that clearly. I remember seeing that like Knott's Berry. I remember Knott's Berry Farm appearing to be like across the street yeah, from it's Disney, close by. like literally in the shadow of Disney Disneyland. Though that is where Steve Martin got his that is start true. in entertainment. So respect for Knott's Berry Farm and Three Amigos. Hell yeah! <laughs> and Orange County. John, what about your Calif- oh. California? You lived in California. I lived in California for eight years. You were a Californian. Years. I was, I was, I was there for eight years before moving up here to Portland and uh, I loved my time in Los Angeles. I don't, I didn't spend too much time 
in Orange County, uh, with the exception of the times where I would go to uh, medieval times or <laughs> I lo- I, it's the least uh, animal rights thing about me is my love for medieval times. But man, oh, man, is that place enjoyable. And uh, I am always proud to say that I have arrived to medieval times in not one but two limos because if you hold me responsible for planning a bachelor party in Los Angeles or anywhere where there's <laughs> driving distance to a medieval times, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> you're, you're not having the bachelor party you thought you were going to have. Are there any other times that you've gone to medieval times? I mean, I know that there are, but like in, let's say, recent memory, oh. we'll say the last 20 years. Uh, not that there recent, was perhaps a time when when I went when I lived in Southern California, when it wasn't part of like a big group extravaganza. It was more of like a, hey, screw it, let's go to medieval times. Like one time, maybe. Like you happened. watched Cable Guy, and and I don't need like, to watch Cable not? Guy to get the idea to go to medieval times, Dan. Oh, I know, but it <laughs> it does make it 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 does make it better. And that's a movie that we should we should cover. A, a Ben a Ben Stiller, uh, John John, <laughs> a Ben Stiller John who uh, makes an appearance in our movie of the week Orange County. He sure does. Yeah. Shall we talk about uh, uh, Orange County or yeah, any other? Do, do you want a California synopsis? memories? To, oh, to, I'm sure plenty. Like... I'm sure plenty will come up. I I you know I I lived there for a long time. There's not like a one specific thing that's like that jumps out as being a very like. Uh, and that time in California, I did this. You know, it it all bleeds together. But I love the the state. Well, I I've enjoyed all different parts of it. Whether it was you know Mount Shasta in Northern California, or all the way down to San Diego, um, it's it's a beautiful state. And soon it will be lost to the oceans after the the big one hits, and it makes it go away. C'est la vie, the future island of California. And and may I add, before we move into the synopsis, that, of course, some of my favorite experiences visiting California were visiting you while you were yeah. living there. I was kind of hoping that you were going to say that your favorite memory was when we went and got, went to see uh, the, the, dark the Dark Crystal. Oh, at the Hollywood Forever the Cemetery? Hollywood Forever Cemetery. No, if you, okay, so if I was not keeping it specific to Orange County, right. I probably would have. I've had a lot of good times in California because I've been to San Francisco, and yeah. Los Angeles, but but Dark Crystal at Hollywood Forever Cemetery is one that comes up frequently. That was a good day. That's a flex. That was that was a good day. When I have the opportunity to, to sling that story... And that was, a, but also so many other good times in California, a state I really enjoy visiting. Yeah. All right. Well, let's kick it to the synopsis, shall we? Kick it. Distraught and looking for meaning after his best friend's sudden passing, high school senior Sean Brumder comes across a book in the sand of a SoCal beach that changes his life. When Sean discovers that the author of his new favorite book, Marcus Skinner, teaches at Stanford University, he decides to mail Skinner a copy of his own short story and attend Stanford in the fall to study under his favorite author's tutelage. But after Sean's careless guidance counselor sends Stanford the transcript of a different, underachieving student, Sean is denied admission and takes it upon himself to head up to the Bay Area from Orange County to prove his worth to the admissions officer. He is aided by his burnout brother and his devoted girlfriend, who helps him despite the fact that Sean going to Stanford would mean that they would likely have to break up, seeing as how she would be staying in Orange County to study marine biology. And unbeknownst to Sean, he is also helped by his mostly absent multimillionaire father, who is harboring confusing feelings for his ex-wife, Sean's mom. So Colin Hanks is, you know, this is his breakout role as Sean. Uh, This is kind of like the introduction to son of Tom Hanks, you know, being a, you know, your new Tom Hanks. Well, a son of Tom Hanks. Let's not, let us not ignore Chet. Let's ignore Chet. Chet will not be ignored. Chet. I love Chet Hanks. I am a Chet Hanks fan. Dan- mostly because I just, it's perfect. It is perfect that Tom Hanks has two sons, like Chet, who's, how would you describe Chet Hanks? Well, with the three words that he used to describe oh. his summer few years ago, white boy summer. White, yes, Chet Hanks, yeah. who I believe, and, coined the phrase white boy son. Yeah, and I also want to acknowledge that he also has a son, Truman Hanks, and a daughter, Elizabeth Ann Hanks. 
Oh, okay. So Truman Hanks, uh, uh, he was in the movie A Man Called Otto. He played okay. young Tom Hanks in that. Wouldn't it be crazy if Tom Hanks was like really disappointed that he didn't get the role of Truman in the Truman Show and named his child that I like just <laughs> a as spite some... naming? Well, just like who would do that? Like Tom Hanks, most people wouldn't do that, but Tom Hanks is just like I'm going to do that. I'm going to go there. <laughs> I'm never gonna lose out on a. I'm never gonna lose out on a role. Like I would have won the Oscar for that. Well, I've been proud of it to this day. Should that have been the case, no. I feel like the uh, the the actual history worked out just fine. All due respect to all the the Hanks children, but Colin Hanks, this is his breakout. He definitely has the Tom Hanks. He he definitely were, has some of the like the young Tom Hanks qualities. Yeah, absolutely. Buddies, kind of like a spastic a spastic energy. Uh, in this movie, more than in a lot of his other works, yeah. he's definitely shown who he is as an actor over the course of his career. I mean, he, he's kind of partnered up with Jake Kasdan, the director of this movie, a few other times uh, in the in the newer Jumanji movies. Uh, he's also, you know, he's also is with his dad and a few other things, you know, early on, but uh, he really like steps out and, and does his own thing. I thought that his role in Mad Men was pretty great. He was the priest. Uh, oh, he right. was on Fargo, the TV series, which of yes. course we love and talk about every chance that we can get. Um, he was so good. Yeah, he was great in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Dexter. Oh, that's right. He was in Dexter. He was one of the 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 killers. Uh, much like John Lithgow, who plays he, Sean, plays Sean's dad. In, uh, he was two seasons past in, in John County. Lithgow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Lithgow. The season was my last season watching. That, that was the peak. Yeah, I've seen them all, but that was the peak. Like if you if you bowed out after the Lithgow season, you went out when when the series was on top. And that's that's exactly what I did. The Colin Hanks uh, Edward James almost season was not bad. Oh, that was and Edward Colin James Hanks, almost as well. Yes, it's an interesting little twist on things. I don't want to spoil it. So as Sean's brother Lance, we have Jack Black, who really became kind of the focal point of the marketing for this film, I feel. You know, he's on the poster, which is, uh, or at least some versions of the poster, yeah. which I feel is a slight to Colin Hanks. But... um well, they're you know, both, I think on the official poster, it's both of them, right? right? Where like their heads are facing opposite directions. And they've got oranges in different parts of their face and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. Catherine O'Hara plays their mom, uh, who, you know, uh, her character, she, you know, after the divorce from John Lithgow's character, becomes an alcoholic and is a very not nice person and marries this kind of old man who doesn't really have he's has he's mobility got money. issues but he's got money she married him for the money uh skylar fisk plays ashley who is sean's girlfriend harold ramis is the well, admissions director i'm just kind of going to blow oh, through just yeah. the cast uh jane adams is uh works in the admissions department at stanford marcus skinner the author is kevin klein other other folks we have got in there gary marshall chevy chase lily tomlin as the uh, guidance counselor Leslie Mann is in there as John Lithgow's new wife. Uh, Mike White, who uh, wrote the film, is yeah. the uh, he's the he's the Dan of the he, movie. He's the English teacher. Uh, OK, I I know you said we're not elaborating, but <laughs> we can come back to that <laughs> oh, okay. uh, if you'd like. But uh, yeah, there's definitely some stuff he does that I don't necessarily do the same way. Oh, jeez. There's definitely like the beginning of my Shakespeare unit definitely has like a list of movies. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Some of which are repeated by it, him. That's that's unfortunate. <laughs> I I'm going to own up to it. I do it, but I personally think I give a little bit more respect to the plays and the author well, I, than the Mike, the Mike White. Can, well, that's and it's one of the things that I love about this movie is that it's kind of skew on on reality, which is a Mike White. Trademark. Oh, that's Mike White's thing for sure. Yeah, uh, we have Nat Faxon as Kip and Lizzie Kaplan as uh, just a, a, is she a cheerleader dancer, just a girl oh. at the school. 
is she's the one who gets into Stanford? Is she the one? Uh, wait, hold on a second. Because she is no, no she is no. just one of the people who dances to Crazy Town's Butterfly. Right. Come oh, party girl. She's. At, I think she's at the the college party. I I thought that she was at the high school. Um, in the high school part when they are doing the group dance, or maybe she's, she's at credited. The party. She's credited as party girl. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. So, but Monica Kina is the one who plays uh, Gretchen, who I believe is the the cheerleader who gets into Stanford and. Right. Yeah, who th- dances to to butter? They do the the dance to butterfly, which I love how that song comes back and great moment in the movie. <sighs> that song, well, what's that song and this movie are both like perfect stamps of a time in American teenage history. Tie it with a bow of Jimmy Eat World's The Middle. Oh, absolutely, yeah, coming in at the end. But yes. If yeah, Absolutely. if there if there is a time capsule for 2002, the movie Orange County is in it, and so is the single for Butterfly by Crazy Town. Absolutely, it just really represents what was popular at a, in a very specific and very narrow specific period of time. Yes, the like the the girls with the low rise jeans, and yeah, all, all of it. It was post 9-11. Let's we'll just leave it at that and and be But it's a very different. This was how we dealt with our trauma as a nation with uh, rap, rap rock, uh, crazy town. Yeah. And Jimmy World and whatever else is in this movie that is typical of 2002. Well, I do want to give a shout out to one song that's in this movie that kind of connects with the last movie we did, Mud, which is. Love and Mercy, Brian Wilson. Right. Uh, yes. You know, there's a bit of a Beach Boys uh, song and, and pivotal moments in, in each of the films, which is fun. Uh, coming back to coming back to Love and Mercy, unless you're not ready for me to. But uh, it's it's used beautifully. And even though yeah. Crazy Town is not is not on the same level all due respect to to crazy town but uh butterfly not quite on the same level as a song but still used very intentionally in the movie sure. it's it's not like i think the middle is more thrown in because this is the popular song it's the for, energy yeah for yeah. for kids of this age but crazy and crazy town there are a lot of other songs that they could have used, but or butterfly. I keep calling the song crazy town, Yeah, but butterfly. It's just the perfect, it's got the perfect balance, the perfect ratio of all things, 2002. And it's also, I love, I think it's kind of, it's used in a way that is not necessarily complimentary to the song, especially when it comes no. back at the college party. No, it's definitely more played for the ridiculousness of the song. But it's like it's it it's almost an evidence of vapidity because he's kind of interested. He's talking to uh he's talking to this girl that he meets. She's sitting on on a bench and she's reading and he's like, "Oh, college. Yes, Stanford. This is where I should be with intelligent people who read." And it's kind of everything he gets called out for later like yeah. being uh, a a bit uh you know having a superiority complex mm-hmm. but and he he goes to this party kind of feeling like oh this is where i belong and he finds out like no it's just high school without the parents right. <laughs> supervising totally yeah i also want to point out that the song butterfly makes an appearance in another movie from the year prior saving silverman also featuring jack black there is a there is a connection there. Interesting. I want to say that's a song that like Amanda Pete is like it shows, you know, it's playing with when like Jason Biggs first sees Amanda Pete's character. Like that's I haven't seen the oh, movie right. forever. So but that's just my memory of it. I remember a lot of Neil Diamond. I remember Neil Diamond. Well, being yeah, in of the course movie. there's gonna yes. be so much Neil Diamond. It's about a Neil Diamond tribute band. Yes. I, you know, I enjoyed Saving Silverman. When I saw it once upon a time. Yeah, so. Saving Silverman is one that I definitely want to revisit, but it's never streaming anywhere, so I don't. No, I, you know, I give up on point, that idea. It'll happen fast. at some point, but I remember it being a fun movie. Orange County 
another mo- a movie that I kind of held in the same esteem, though rewatching it, going back to that moment where they incorporate love and mercy. Yeah. And as well as the second appearance of Butterfly, I really felt like there is a there's a depth. And I think this also comes from perspective and age, but there's a depth to this movie that I didn't catch initially when I first saw it. And this would have been a a rental. I did not see this in the theater. Do you remember when you first saw it? No, I think it was a, a rental maybe in the early days of Netflix DVD delivery by mail. Rest in peace. Sad, sad. I is it? I was I was among the first, but it's okay. I was an early adopter. I definitely was. I I definitely saw it around that time and was kind of like, okay, moving on. Or it was, or it was just like on a friend's DVD shelf, and it was just like, let's watch this. Or a roommate that I had around that time. Right. I'm sure it was a good, like, previously viewed, especially if you're, you know, at college, in college and you're like, oh, this is an old good stoned and watch this. Well, also for me, you know, I graduated high school in 2001. So I was the age, essentially, of the people in this movie at that time. And, like, for a movie to... Uh, kind of capture the feeling of i mean i didn't grow up in southern california but there were a lot of like you know like i was saying it's the time those time capsule elements where it was just like this is a bit of a snapshot into what was going on for you know for me a little bit in my world and it's it's so cool that you say that because as i was watching orange county i was thinking of another movie that that we are going, to, I'm almost certain we are going to be visiting it on our road trip a little further down the down the road. So I won't say too much, but it's okay. a film that I definitely had a similar vibe with, and f- also felt I'm this I'm the same age as that character. Oh, okay. I am experiencing kind of what this character is experiencing in some way, shape, or form. So I will remember when it, when the time comes, of okay. course, because it's a very, it, it, very you know, s- specific and significant. But when the time comes, I will connect it back yeah. to Orange County. Well, there's another movie that I want to try and connect to the movie Orange County in a in kind of a roundabout way. Dan, did you clock what the name of their high school was? Oh. I, you didn't. You would no. know. If you clocked it, you would have known that it was Vista Del Mar High School, which is a fictional high school in the same way that Vista Del Mar is a fictional place in Florida in the movie Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. It is oh. just such a generic name of like a, you know, beachside scenic place. How did I miss that? I love Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. It was just one shot that just shows the, you know, the placard in front of the high school. It said Vista Del Mar High I'm... School. And I was just like, oh, oh my God, it's happening. <laughs> Come on, Dan. You're slipping. You're yeah. Catch these things. All right. So I also wanted to talk a bit about Lily Tomlin's character, the guidance counselor. And first of all, I. You know, she is the the character that makes this movie, you know, makes the plot move forward because she's the one that first tells him, no, don't apply to any other schools. You want to go to Stanford. You got this. This is You're your a dream. Shoo-in. You're a shoe in And then she, the next time she sees him, has no idea who he is. She had sent the wrong transcript to them. Dan, do you know who else got into a college because the guidance counselor sent the wrong information? I believe our brother Scott. That's did. true. That's true. <laughs> Scott brothers... got into he got into Brandeis University because the <laughs> guidance counselor was supposed to send the application to Boston University and messed up. <laughs> Is that what happened? Okay, if, if, there if was... my memory serves, then yes. I couldn't remember how or why it happened, but I remember that, and because. I teach high school seniors and we talk about college applications. Yeah. I tell that story every year about how Scott got into Brandeis without applying. But now, <laughs> thank you for filling in the missing piece. Yeah. I, I If I remember correctly, it's that it was supposed I'm gonna go to be with an that. application to Boston University and the guidance counselor just flubbed. 
<laughs> and, and, but it's and such a, a it's such a move that Lily Tomlin's character would have done. It's so funny. I mean, along those lines, it's not the most unbelievable situation. Well, what's important to know is that because this is taking place in the early 2000s, this is before the time of applying online. You had yes. to fill out paper forms. The guidance counselor had all of the forms for the different got the forms to the different colleges to to submit, and you did it through your guidance counselor, and that's just how it's done. I, I don't know if that's if it's done any way similarly to that anymore, but there's there was no online option at the time, barely. But I'll I'll share this anecdote here, please. One year during my teaching career, I had a student who was applying to schools in the UK. Okay. And she needed to have someone from the school send her transcript, anticipated SAT scores, because it was before she got her SAT scores, oh. anticipated GPA, and she needed it to come from, I forget if it was someone, I don't think it was someone other than a counselor, because long story short, I ended up doing it because the counselor didn't. Got it. Or didn't it, I think it was the counselor? I don't think it was another teacher that that kind of dropped the ball. But I ended up I ended up doing it twice for this student. Oh, okay. So in that in that respect, there's things like that that need to be followed up on. But yeah. look, we we are talking twenty over twenty years ago. The Har the not Harvard Stanford acceptance list is printed mm -hmm. on a dot matrix printer. You can see the perforated notches along the side. <laughs> yes, it, it, we are still in a time of paper and mail, like paper acceptance letters. Right. Uh, the girl, the cheerleader gets her acceptance. Uh, her ex Is it where she gets the letter or where her mom like comes to the school and tells her? I think that she's just tells her over the phone or something and she's just like, I got it to Stanford. Right. Yeah. But it's still a letter. It's not like yeah. now. Now they have something called the Common App. Well, Do you know what the Common App is? Oh, no, I don't. Common App is something that it's a it's a it's a website uh, that colleges all use. And you basically upload one application. You have teachers. So like as a teacher, I'll get a request. A student will say, mm -hmm. hey, can you do a recommendation for me? And I'll say yes. And say then no, buzz off. And I'm a doormat, so I will say yes, no matter how many I have. Props to this to the class of 2024, because a lot of them asked me last spring. Whoa. OK. Yes. So props to them. But more often than not, you're getting asked with like a week to write the letter yeah, yeah, at yeah. the busiest time of the year. Yada, yada, yada. You upload and then you just fill out the thing on Common App and it goes to any of the schools that use it. Not every college uses sure. Common App. A lot of schools out there. But even if they don't, they're still doing things electronically. There's none of this paper anymore. Right. It's it, very hard for so, a mishap like this to happen. So... For for now, and if the if this common app is being used, are there actual like snail mail accept acceptance packets, or is it all just through this app? I bel I I don't know if they get their acceptance materials mm. through the app, but I'm almost positive it's it's digital. It might come directly from the school. Okay, if, when they're accepted, but. I think it's still an email. I don't think they're getting the physical pack. I don't think it's a thing where like, oh, it's a thin envelope. I didn't get in. I know. Well, that was part of the, uh, you know, the nerves about it was just like checking the mail. But, you know, and there's a scene in here where he calls, Sean calls his brother and he's like, did the mail come yet? And he like has to go to the mailbox and check it. And uh, yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big difference between getting just a regular envelope and getting a packet. Right. And when you, as soon as you see that it's the envelope. Oh, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're And kind of surprised he doesn't. <laughs> well, you know, he was excited. Yeah. And also it's a fictional character. So there's that. This is true. It serves he, the story a... better to 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 read the words, to feel the excitement until you actually read the words. You know, John, to paraphrase a movie I know and love, 
three amigos. <laughs> there's there's a Sean Brumder out there for everybody. Every, every school, every yeah. college has a Sean Brumder. There we go. I there's a, you know, there's yeah. a plethora of reasons why. A plethora uh, <laughs> of Sean Brumders <laughs> Sean out Brumders. there in yeah. real life. And none of them might be named Sean Brumder, but one of them could easily be yeah. Sean Brumder. But there is only one Jack Black. Despite how many people have tried to be Jack Black, there is only one. And uh, it would, it's, you know, this movie was really strange to watch because I, it's the, one of the few times where I just wanted less Jack Black because I felt like it, they, he was being used kind of as a way to like cover up any of the patches. And it's just like, no, just kind of like let the movie breathe and let the movie be a little bit. And, you know that there's no way that Sean, knowing his brother, would have been okay with him going to Stanford and oh, driving John, he's a, there. He's a fictional character. <laughs> but in the world of this movie, no. somebody who is so I, focused on uh, making it happen. I agree. I totally agree. That was yeah. a big D- distraction from not a huge distraction for me because it's it, it's an 88 minute movie but uh it was definitely like come on kid if you want to go to stanford but you don't realize that like your brother is gonna fuck it up whatever well, it is and maybe there was some sort of like you know s- studio decree of like there needs to be this much this percent of jack black you know since high fidelity came out <laughs> i can only imagine that more however far along this movie was in pre-production yeah when high fidelity came out was there anything i guess there was saving silverman saving but silverman, that wasn't yeah. necessarily a huge hit high fidelity was really the breakout yeah. but i can only imagine that there was okay if jack if this is characters being played by jack black there must be more of him but we really don't care what he does as long as he is Jack Black doing it Jack Black style. He's got to pretend he's a ninja. He's got to he's got to yeah. roll around. He's well, got to be sexy. You know, before this came out, we did have Shallow Hal. You know, that was two thousand one. So that's a starring role oh, for him. Oh yeah. Aside from that, he was doing a lot of these smaller roles. You know, he was in Jesus' Son and Cradle of Rock. Uh, I still know what you did last summer. Uh, oh, right. well, cable guy. You know, he was he was like the guy, guy in the van and enemy of the state. Yeah, he he. I want to say he had a couple of those type roles, the like jackal. the jackal. Yep. In the jackal, he pops up right. So, like throughout the nineties, he's yeah. popping up in these the movies. cable guy, the fan, Mars attacks, right, Waterworld, as we've talked about before, which is like a deleted scene. Yes, yes, and one of my favorites, Airborne. He Airborne. was also a Demolition Man. And uh, quite, I guess you could say famously his first role is Bob Roberts, but it's famously only because of like, you know, the Tim Robbins connection and the theater, you know, where they all kind of came up or where he came up under Tim Robbins kind of tutelage. He kind of has those two connections working for him throughout his career because Tim Robbins also made Cradle Will Rock. It's a great movie I have not seen since it was in the theater, but He's got that Tim, he he had that Tim Robbins connection, but also in with Judd Apatow. So like through Cable Guy and Ben Ben Stiller, that whole network there. So, and and Jim Carrey, who of course goes on to star in The Truman Show instead of Tom Hanks. (laughs) Sun Collins stars in Orange County. We don't want to start the rumor that Tom Hanks like holds a grudge about not being in uh, The Truman Show. No, we don't. I do. (laughs) <laughs> it's going to be Hollywood legend. I really think that this movie, it's a lot of fun to watch. I thought that Kevin Klein is great as the author, Marcus Skinner. <laughs> he's course. perfect. Of he's, course. he's always perfect. He's such, yes. you know, find me a better person to just be like, you know, an, a counterculture author. Makes perfect sense. You could yeah. do Kevin Klein on cruise control. It's still great. Also, he's got that connection to Jake Kasdan, son of Lawrence Kasdan, right. who collaborated a lot. Kevin Klein was kind of the the De Niro, more the De Niro to Lawrence Kasdan's yeah. Scorsese. And also, talking about Jake Kasdan for a second, I do not want to uh, diminish his prowess just because he is the son of another famous director because the work that he did with walk hard, the Dewey Cox story is legendary. 
You know, he yes. co-wrote it with Apatow. He directed it. He, you know, co-wrote a lot of the songs. You know, Jake Kasdan, because of Walk Hard, you know, thumbs up in my book. Well, not just Walk Hard. He also directed and produced on Freaks and Geeks. Oh, absolutely. He's no and, schlub. He's no schlub. And, unde- and undeclared. He also directed, I know it's not, Walk Hard is brilliant. Uh, Bad Teacher, I have a soft spot in my heart for. I... I enjoyed it. I saw it. It came out like as I was studying to be a teacher. Oh, uh, okay. So that was during I, that time where everything was bad blank. You know, there was like bad right. grandpa and, uh, you know. Well, it started with bad, bad Santa. Santa. Right. And then there was bad right, lieutenant, bad, bad <laughs> lieutenant, bad company, bad lieutenant, port of call, New Orleans, yep. bad girls. There was bad girls. Was bad girls the one that was kind of like, Young guns, but women. Yes. Okay. I, kind of doing a doing that a you know a little bit before it, it, it you know became kind of the quote unquote thing to do. By right. The way. Yeah. So bad girls. I've never seen it, but I uh, haven't seen it either. No. It, 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 I remember it coming out, and eh, someday, someday I'll catch it. So, bad news bears. Bad news the bears. remake with Billy Bob Thornton. Also at that time. <laughs> That's true. Also, uh, you know, a legend of. Bad blank movies. Anyway, I have nothing else. I have nothing else. I'm there's not nothing keep else going. to talk moving, about. Moving, moving right along. So yes, no. Jake Kasdan is uh, a uh, you know fantastic director. This was his first uh, his his directorial feature directorial debut. Sure. Yeah. And uh, you know, always interesting. I haven't seen the. Have you seen the Jumanji like what reboot? I saw the sequels? first one, and it just wasn't for me. No. No. Wasn't for me. I I understood why they did what they did, but it just you know wasn't for me, and that's it okay. Feels it feels to me, and this is coming from not having seen it, that it's kind of trying to uh, take some of the success of the Night at the Museum franchise. Well, I get that vibe from it. Yeah, I don't. We're know. running away from scary animals. Sure, yes, there is that, but a lot of it has to do with the. Uh, you know, the the kids that get sucked into it becoming these avatars, you know, these different characters. And so, you know, Jack Black's character is, it's a teenage girl who's being the character. And so he is kind of embodying a teenage girl oh, while being okay. Jack Black. And then, you know, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson is kind of the the kid who's the hero and then there's like the Kevin, I forget what kind of kid is the Kevin Hart one. And maybe that's like the football player kid. I don't know. But also it's like, I, I'm over, I, I don't know. I'm just not a big Kevin Hart fan. And uh, I feel like there's just a lot of jokes in there that just aren't my style. And that's okay. I'm glad that there are people who do enjoy it, but it's just not for me. There's really not much appeal to it, honestly, for me. It's not like it's like, man, I've been, ah, I just have not had the opportunity to sit down and watch these movies. Also, now, I didn't love the original Jumanji. Neither did I. So I should have. It. it was exactly, you know, for my age range. I want to go ahead and say that maybe it was a little lazy and it was maybe a, a little bit like Robin Williams on Cruise Control. Yeah, at that point it, where he's doing these things, probably more for the paychecks than the love of it, because I think we we've we saw in his career when he did projects that he was passionate about. Like I'm sure he'd rather do. I'm sure he rather would have done many more like world's greatest dads. Right, but that was later on in his career. Uh, but even early on, he still was an actor that took chances or that chances were taken oh, with him. We, we've absolutely. talked about Popeye. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, starting yeah. from the from the beginning there. Yeah. So we've got Orange County here. Who else in the cast have we not talked about? We talked about so Skylar Fisk, the uh, a, a fine actress, uh, also the daughter of a fine actress, Sissy Spacek. Yeah, and you know she had a pretty short lived acting career, right? Yeah, I uh, I don't think she's done. I don't I don't think she did much. I feel like she did more kind of like indie films and maybe and oh, music. I guess she's still a little bit more active. Some things that I've never heard of before, but after Orange County, let's see. Just last year, she was in uh, Sam and Kate, which is with uh, Dustin Hoffman, her mom, Sissy Spacek. 
uh, Jake. Oh, Hoffman. right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you're right because it was it was the parents and their their kids in it. Right. I remember seeing that that was streaming and and thinking, ah, oh, I'm not interested. Yeah. And according to the poster, she looks exactly the same as she did in 2002. So 20 right. years later. Oh, Snow Day. She was in Snow Day. That was one that I really remembered her. I never saw in. Snow Day. Was that like kind of like one of those like Nickelodeon movies where like it was supposed to be like a Pete and Pete movie? Something like kind that. Kind of, probably. I want to look yes. that up real quick because I yes. feel like that was part of like the the lore behind it. Oh, maybe not. Or maybe it was like Recess or something like that. There, there was that whole subgenre of Nickelodeon movies, and which I guess this kind of falls under that same umbrella because it's an MTV movie. Oh, and it's here we go. Viacom. Snow Day. It was originally planned to be a movie based on the adventures of Pete and Pete, but the idea was aborted and the film was rewritten as a standalone story. There you go. That's Makes on perfect nickelodeon.fandom.com. I have no trouble believing that. Bam, Skylar Fisk. Yeah, did a couple of movies with her mom early earlier on in her career. Uh, the, the Long Walk Home uh, was one, uh, Sissy Spacek and, and Whoopi Goldberg. Okay. Yeah, um, I believe living in the uh, Jim Crow South. Mm. Yes. Uh, oh, she's during... in the Babysitter's Club. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it looks like she's been focusing more on music. Cool. Over the yeah, last, she's got a few know, albums. Had years. one out last year called We Could Be All Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm sure it sounds like she's doing what she what she wants to do and she's doing well. She's uh, you know, graduated from the University of Virginia in 2006. All right. Oh, she she really fit in this movie though. I felt like she, she felt right. You know, as kind of the the SoCal aspirations to be a marine biologist, uh, you know, loyal girlfriend, the and, hard on you know, her sleeve, yeah, type, yeah. Uh, this is getting into spoiler territory, but Dan, what did you think about the ending? So at the end of the movie, he uh, ultimately decides <laughs> not to go to Stanford, and then everybody just applauds. And it's like everybody meeting like his father who just donated how many millions the of dollars least to Stanford? The believable part of the movie. Yeah. Including when Jack Black and Jane Adams burn down the admissions building at yeah. Stanford after they smoke a joint and have sex. Or yeah. not in that order, I guess. Uh, no, I was like, I was mad. I was so angry. I was like, and go for a fucking semester. God damn. I know it it was a little it was a little disappointing and and it's not just because of all of the things that they did to get there but it's like I don't know I I felt a little disappointed like why did we do all of this and right, I guess I, he learned a lesson about himself but but he kind of got that all from Marcus Skinner like in his brief discussion at with him Stanford at Stanford so yeah. I was really I was pissed at him because this is supposed to be, it's a character. He's a protagonist that I think we're supposed to like that definitely has his flaws and challenges uh, and definitely challenges us at times. And uh, Skylar Fisk's character calls him out on it. Yeah. Eventually after really like putting up with him and, and following him, not blindly, but really oh yeah, being there for him and supporting him no matter what. But she uh, rightfully, you know, kind of tells him off about, you know, he's being selfish and he's and and that's how he ends the movie is kind of selfishly. And are we supposed to think that he didn't end up going? It, this is not I'm not felt, like, oh, I want a sequel yeah. that shows us what happened. It felt disrespectful that he put everybody through all of this. Us and- included. Us included, Us included, and he then decided to stay in Orange County. And, you know, as we know, you don't have to stay at the place where you go to college. You can go wherever you want. You can, uh, I, I don't know, spend your summers back there and be back pretty frequently. I mean, you don't have to change the way you pronounce water. No. Just you because you don't. don't live in the place where they pronounce it like that. Yeah. And you can still and like, yeah, it's not like he's leaving Orange County. In fact, I think he kind of misinterprets Skinner's advice. Right. Yeah. He's taking it very literally. 
Yeah, I so that that didn't really supposed to be a good writer and yeah, like yeah, that that didn't work for me. I also felt like um, the whole storyline with John Lithgow and Catherine O'Hara. I understand how why he would want to not be with his current wife anymore. Uh, you know Leslie Mann's character, but it doesn't make sense to me why he necessarily wants to get back together with Catherine O'Hara's character. He gives a nice little, you know, speech about, you know, finding himself driving to their house and all that kind of stuff. But like Catherine O'Hara also has just like a lot of work to do on herself and she's still married to, what was well, it Frank? Bob. Bob. That's what Bob. it was. And Okay, so the John the John Lithgow flip there, right? He's kind of skipping that step of maybe I need to be alone for a while. I yeah. did. T- I took that to be a character flaw, and this is a guy who doesn't who doesn't stay single. This is a guy who doesn't yeah. who does just casually date. He's going to go from being married to Catherine O'Hara yeah. to being married to Leslie Mann to now being married to Catherine O'Hara. Well, yeah, once I the paperwork or, clears or just be living. I have no idea how it's how it would work, but Bob seems fine at the end of it. Yeah, Bob He's kind of an, just there. Bob takes an ass kicking throughout the movie. He sure does. And ends up like all smiles and like lucid. Yeah. So that's all good. Yeah. It all just kind of like wraps up really neatly. This is one of the rare movies that I'm going to say maybe could have used another 10 minutes. Wouldn't have suffered for being slightly over an hour and a half versus under. And you know how I am on running times. Uh, Yeah. I I also didn't love the way that Harold Ramis's character kind of resolved itself with asking for aspirin from the girl who came to his place just because she has a bottle of it and then it's like here take as many as you want and it's just like uh, that felt very lazy to me the way that they kind of got him drugged he was on like ecstasy or something at that point right so yeah, uh, yeah I, I didn't love Which that they I set mean, up earlier in the movie oh they set it up fine but yeah. it's just like oh no I'm not yeah, um, yeah I don't I don't love it I enjoy Harold Ramis in love Etsy. Harold Ramis. Always right. love Harold Ramis. This is a movie that does have quite a few shenanigans for the sake yeah. of having shenanigans. I also, speaking of shenanigans, I didn't love, so the characters of Lonnie and Arlo, the like two like best friends, they were fine up until they kind of make a joke about how they were experimenting sexually with one another. And it being just played for the humor of how funny is it that these two guys have romantic feelings for one another. Ha ha ha. Like that doesn't work for me. No, again, it's, it's not necessarily something that, right. It's, it's a joke that's added in, not a natural character development that we, that we follow. No. And it's really played. It's really just thrown in there for laughs. It's not. I also would have liked to have seen more from those characters. I would have well, liked yeah. to have seen them be part of more of the story. Like, why couldn't they have also gone to Stanford? Why sure. couldn't they have followed them to Stanford? Yeah. Why couldn't... Right, yeah. I mean, honestly, ha- having more about them and have them be more characters and not caricatures might have made that development make more sense. Yeah. We'll never know. And well, still, it's, it's still being... It, it, yeah, it's it's not this movie. Right. Well, also, this is the era of road trip movies, specifically like Road Correct. Trip was 2000. And uh, this is a road trip movie that kind of skips the being on the road part because it's not super fast to get from Orange County to the Bay Area. And uh, I know Jack Black says, I can get this there in three hours, but it just kind of no. like, and we're there. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, but so interesting. So that you mentioned uh, those characters and bringing it back to the Mike White character, yeah, and his talk about Shakespeare. Something that I picked up about this movie that I certainly did not twenty years ago, and I will attribute this to my teaching career, is that this movie 
has a lot of Shakespearean elements. It is oh, yeah. a comedy of errors. Yep. You have the the classic characters, the false the the type the the, the false Staffian character being Jack Black, the the one who's there for humor. You yeah. have the young the young lovers. You have uh, kind of a, a mistaken identity going on. Mm-hmm. You have the the sage wisdom, the person that they're seeking out who kind of pops in, which is an element Kevin in Klein, a lot of- which is always wonderful. Right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, also no stranger to Shakespeare, Kevin yeah. Klein. And you've got these two characters who are very much like, yeah, they're comic relief, but they're like the Rosencrantz and Gildenstern Absolutely. Yeah. of this movie. I mean, you could make a, a Rosencrantz and Gild Lonnie is dead, uh, and have a separate spinoff about about them. Yeah. That's not my idea. But they're it it they're characters that kind of speak to this connection between Orange County. And also I I wouldn't necessarily suspect this if I didn't hold Mike White in very high esteem. Yeah. And I would not put it have put it past Mike White to make a slapstick stoner comedy and incorporate it's not based this is not a movie that's based on a Shakespeare play. This is not All's Well That Ends Well, but right. at the end, All's Well That Ends Well, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So nobody is just like, well, maybe I'll call the school back and get have them give me back the money that I just gave them for the admissions office. Nothing matters. All's and that's how Shakespeare's comedies and all this shit happens. And at the end, oh, all's well that yeah. ends well. It's a comedy of errors. Yeah. What are you gonna Shakespeare. do? Shakespeare. Shakespeare. So but uh one of the other thoughts that I had, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier about the Jack Black, you know, the amount of Jack Black and everything. But seeing as how this was an MTV Films, you know, production, I do wonder how much say they had and like we need to put in, you know, Butterfly by Crazy Town. We need to oh, put yeah. in this, this and that. We need to, you know, we need to have Jimmy E World in there. We need to have, um, you know, these certain elements, you know, a studio executive coming in and just being like, hey, let's put in a something about uh, Lonnie and Arlo being gay. You know, like, I feel like that is something that I could see a new production company trying to, like, put their stamp on, I don't know, the the identity of their films. Well, yeah, and it makes sense. I'm looking up what other Viacom properties there were because I'm wondering how much placement like was Crazy Town signed to a Viacom owned label. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh so this is let's see Joe's apartment was the first. Joe's apartment was MTV the first. Film. I remember Dead Men on Campus being like one of that was I think that was like the third. Beavis and yes. Butthead Do America was one of the first ones. Varsity oh, Blues. Wait, yeah. Election. No, Beavis, Beavis and Butthead Do America might have been the first one. Right. Election no, Joe's was apartment was film. Joe's apartment was a few well, at least was released a few months before Beavis and Butthead Do America. Oh, oh, so that was ninety six. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. July ninety six was Joe's apartment, and then December was Beavis and Butthead Do America. Yeah. And then uh Orange County, you know, was several years later, but you know, and they're they're still actually releasing films. You know, well, MTV Documentary uh, is is a an imprint that they have that's definitely very active, mm-hmm. which I think is fantastic. I think it's a great route to take. Jackass Forever was their last one that was. Uh, I mean, I guess you could call it documentary. It's nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs> right, unscripted. Unscripted. But they they do produce actual documentaries. Oh yeah, absolutely. The Eternal Memory uh just came out. That was one um that was from their MTV documentary films. But yeah, MTV Films definitely uh you know was trying to get their I I guess vision out there and a lot of those kind of earlier ones and into this time was you know really felt very uh, representative of kind of what was going on on MTV, the network. And this was, you know, before it became a lot of reality shows, you know, your teen moms and your Jersey shores. So, right. It, you know, I, I'm just wondering how much of a, an effect that had on the final product. 
Oh, I would say there was probably a good amount of executive interference with this and uh, a mandate of having, we must have Jack Black in his underwear. Right. We must have Jack Black doing the Jack Black things that Jack Black does so well. Yeah. Yeah. Jack yeah. Black must appear in some form in every frame. Yeah. So Dan, I, I, I'd love to know, uh, what would you do with Orange County in 2023, all this time later, 21 years later? <laughs> So I don't think I would go the route of a sequel. I'm just not really, I don't know that I'm, I don't, I'm not interested in picking up with these, with these characters, mm -hmm. maybe Skinner. Uh, I would certainly, you know what I want? I want to read the novel. I want to read his, yeah, right? his novel. Like, what was it sounds, called? I, I can't remember what it was called. Oh, um, I don't know. But I also, I can, I, I love that part of, of the plot that he, uh, Straight jacket, straight jacket that like reading this novel. I love I love stories about that where someone f like I found this novel and it changed my life. So I would uh, I would love to read that novel. I would love to uh, I could potentially see this working as a musical uh, potentially featuring like I'm like it's a jukebox musical featuring the songs from like now that's what I call music. Right, right now that's what i call music one like whenever. which i imagine like butterfly in the middle must have been on one of yeah. those but uh, i could see it as a musical i could see it as a i could see it being reworked as just a, a straight play no music uh i you would definitely have less of the jack black character in that i i assume any version that has that does not have jack black will not have as much of that character just because it doesn't make sense. Right. So that's uh that's where I would that's where I would go with this. I don't have any really clever ideas. Of course it's always you can always do a sequel where you're catching up with these characters, but like I said, that's I'm just not feeling that for this. So if anything uh, a musical that perhaps really captures like leaning into the 2002 time capsule yeah. idea. Um, a totally. musical that just totally captures that. And, and really the, the plot for this is, is pretty bare bones. So you could, you could throw in songs. You could have a great, I imagine a great musical number when you've got Sean talking to the, the, the college girl, that he meets reading mm -hmm. when they're at the party and Kip talking to uh, <laughs> Kip. Uh, Skylar Fisk's character. Ashley. Yeah. Ashley. Thank you. I keep forgetting her name, but yeah, so Kip talking and Nat Faxon is so great. Oh, Nat Faxon is, I mean, at that time, perfect college douche. Yes. Yes. Plays yeah. it to a T. So I could kind of see that being a fun little musical number. Uh, where it all kind of collides and comes together. Uh, I could see having a lot of fun with that and, you know, the the mother having a lot to do. And you could certainly throw some nods to, uh, you know, Jack. The, I, the, the songs of that, of like Lance's songs could certainly be yeah. of a, in a Jack Black style, though I don't think, I, now that I'm saying it out loud yeah. and I'm hearing it, it's a bad idea. Yeah. It's a bad, don't do it. Don't do it. If you're listening to me and you're thinking I'm good, if if you are an executive at MTV Productions and you are writing down everything I say because you're analog and not just going to go back and listen again, don't do that idea. It's right. Bad. OK. What are you going to do? What am I going to do? Well, you know, as you were talking, this this is just as you were talking about it. I was thinking about like, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing a grown up Sean. You know, Colin Hanks is great. Love to see Colin Hanks. You know, a grown-up Sean, 20-some-odd years later, he's written a great book and hasn't followed it up with anything and has felt like he's said all that he has to say. And maybe, uh, you know, he reconnects with his estranged brother, you know, and and have like a less wacky, you know, story of the two of them where they can connect but have Jack Black maybe 
be a little bit more toned down. I don't know. That's just what I would want, but not what would happen. So that's not what my idea would be, though, because I like the basics of this plot. You know, someone didn't get into their school of their dreams because of like a clerical era, error, era, <laughs> a, a clerical, clerical era, era. And, okay. their, and their best. Have chance- some water, have some water. <laughs> it's in the drawer and their best chance to go and is to go and make their case in person and uh, even set some time like today where, you know, we do have such a like a connected online. We're in an era of con- era. We're in an era of convenience. And to have somebody actually go above and beyond and like, you know, make a trek to a place and find the people and like really state your case, I think is a really great way to kind of show what it takes to like follow up on your dreams and to like try and make things happen for yourself because uh, it's there's a lot of pressure, I think, for kids today and you would know more about this than I do but to make an impression uh with social media there are so many ways that people are already trying and standing out by doing things that maybe aren't as admirable or that take less skill and uh, to do something that is you know more rare going and seeing somebody in person i think is a uh, worthy of telling a story so yeah i I think that there's just a way that it could be uh, moved around shuffled around a little bit plus also less slapsticky less wacky right and if i can if i can share my my reaction to that this is not just in my wheelhouse of being a teacher it's in my current wheelhouse this is what i'm doing with students right now is working with them on their their life after high school options and essays and helping them write their personal statements, helping them stand out. And thinking about a lot of them in this situation, I really like your idea. Because I can also imagine having the scene where they they meet the admissions and the admissions officer is like, I've never met an applicant in person. Yeah. They're like, oh, you are taller than I've expected. Are they all taller than I've expected? <laughs> what? I'm imagining that, like, you see, it, it, there's, there's so much fodder for that. And it... It makes sense. And especially I think if you have the if you have more of the because what you don't have in here is the parental like, you know, this is why I went to college or this is what which they they kind of waste that opportunity with John Lithgow, who is very successful and could should definitely. And actually with Catherine O'Hara's character would have added so much depth if she if there was some background with her about college so i think if you have that context of the older generation saying like we like you're doing all of this electronically how do you have it you took a virtual tour of the school right. i mean i imagine imagine the movie opening on like a kid wearing a vr headset and they're on a tour of of stanford <laughs> or it opens with a tour of stanford but then it's revealed that the entire time yeah. it's been in virtual reality yeah. yes 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 so, well i think that there's also something to be said about the difference between even like 2002 And today with alternative options to going to college because college is not affordable. It is impossible to, you know, without being in debt for your entire life to really go to, you know, most colleges. Right. And you could you could easily turn this into something about a scholarship. Sure. Yeah. Versus except because that's that's a big deal. There are uh, to your point about the the options. There are so many. And I don't think this is necessarily uh, relevant to these ideas, but I'm going to share it anyway. The uh, many like other opportunities. I was talking to a student the other day. First, they told me they were taking a gap year. And, you know, just from my interactions with this kid, I wasn't like, oh, yeah, OK, that means they're going to like be in their pajamas. Yeah. But they're they're actually in a program that sends high school graduates who are taking a quote unquote gap year to 
I think they said they're going to is it Indonesia, oh, cool. Guatemala, like they're go- traveling to four different places in the world and working in communities, doing service projects. I think it's mi- I think it's kind of a- tied to missionary work, but still it's like there it's not what when I think when some people hear gap year, that's what they think. I don't think it means right. that anymore. For a lot of people, they are in in high school taking classes at a skills center where they're gaining the skills and accreditations that they need to yeah. work in different professions. So in in some ways, it's uh, opening those doors a lot sooner and helping students and saying, you know, you can learn everything you need while you're in high school. Right. So as long as you can get yourself to this place to learn it. And that's cool. A lot of community colleges are offering free college yeah. uh, to to students. So I I, I have a, I have a fresh idea, hot fresh. off the hot off the presses. Perfect the for MTV still films. Wet. They're fresh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what if the whole thing is just flipped? It's reversed, and it's about a school that because it's so unaffordable, they are tr- they're trying desperately to get good students or it's like an exclusive program maybe it isn't even a college but it's like a very special like specialized program that only admits like 15 people a year and they accidentally accept the wrong person and instead they reject this person that's been like you know the the talk of the town and they really want to get this person in their program because of the clout so kind of like the college version of the good place (laughs) The college version of The Good Place. I don't know. That's what it made me think of where she ends up in. I mean, of course, if you know people who watch the series know yeah. where things go with that. But the premise, the original premise that uh, that she ends up in uh, in heaven when she should be in hell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I, exactly. And I also I thought initially you were going to go the police academy route where like Stanford just starts admitting like any like anyone with like interest like you're interesting you're in because we need to diversify so well no and it's you know and then it becomes a a story about somebody working in admissions who screwed up trying to undo their error and like going and finding the person that they accidentally accepted and like you know, pretending there's somebody else to try to convince them not to go and, you know, like because they it, can't bring themselves to tell them I screwed up. And yeah. You didn't well, actually yeah, get absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> they have to try to find clever ways to get the person to not go to. to I don't know. John, that's a, a legit route. idea. That's a I legit idea. We need to contact not <laughs> even MTV, just films. MTV films. I think we should let them have the first shot. Can we call it reverse Orange County? <laughs> I think we should call it Marin County. Eat, eat, <laughs> Newark, egg, oh. <laughs> narrow. That's well, Orange County backwards. I think those are some uh, funky, fresh ideas. We're going to start writing reverse Orange County right away. Here I was thinking my my now, that's what I call music jukebox <laughs> musical, was going to be the toast of the town. Reverse Orange <laughs> County. That's the Did shit Did we both right just there. use the use the term toast of the town? Uh, and just rapidly one after the other. I, I, sorry, I did it subconsciously. I didn't do Toast it. Toast of the town. Nobody yeah. says that anymore. <laughs> well, yes, no, we both just said it in, yeah. yeah, but in never again. That's, it needs to go back below for another it's hundred gone. years. It's gone. Well, Dan, this was a lot of fun talking about Orange County. Do you want to tell everyone what we're going to be talking about on our next episode? Yes, on our next episode, we're traveling northeast. We're going from Orange County, California to Denver, Colorado. Or is it Colorado? Do they have a Nevada thing going on there? I don't know. We'll do some research. We need some Coloradans to check in here. Yeah, ruinchildhoodspot at gmail.com. Let us know how it's pronounced. And we will be talking about things to do in Denver when you're dead. The movie, not a suggested list of activities. Right. Uh, it's, uh, from 1995, directed by Gary Fleeter, written by Scott Rosenberg, starring Andy Garcia, Christopher Walken, Christopher Lloyd, uh, um, uh, Treat Williams. Oh, rest in power. Yeah. No. Yeah. Pour one out for Treat. John, uh, William Forsyth, not John Forsyth. I am definitely looking forward to it. I have never seen the movie, 
So this is a good opportunity for me. Oh, well, I'm excited to talk about I have not seen it since it's it's VHS days. So it'll be yeah. a nice it'll be a nice treat to go back almost 30 years and take a look at things to do in Denver when you're dead. Well, Dan, as you are heading home from the store with your Nestle Crunch ice cream bar and a copy of Three Amigos, I wish you a good journey. Good journey. Good journey.